Ryan, he hears from the Lord, I'll tell you that much. He's, he's got like this connection where it's like God and him. Let's say this together, Lord Jesus. He has had an amazing impact on the kids that are here. So here's the deal, okay? He can relate to these kids like probably nobody else that I've seen. I love Ryan's passion. Because Jesus refused to let his world come crashing down because of something he knew God would take care of. He's just an amazing, very inspiring guy. It's really hard to imagine that this great, outgoing guy that loves all these kids really wasn't like that when, at one point in his life. Somebody mentioned to me about, you know, Ryan's past, and I was just like, what? I mean, no, I'm like, Ryan Brown? I mean, do, do you mean like our pastor, Ryan? And he's like, yeah. I was like, no. Nah. I was like, no, nah, that can't be right. I once was lost. I was breaking up with my first husband, Ryan's father, when he was only about two. And it hadn't been a good marriage, but it, uh, it got progressively worse and I had to, I had to end it. He was my mom's youngest child and there was just a lot of problems in our household. So she kind of focused on him. You know, he used all his family for as much as they were willing to give him. Um, his mom always was there for him. Ever since I was 12, I just, I've, I've started and never stopped. Um, progressively, by the time I was 14, I was dropping LSD and smoking PCP. 16, stealing marijuana out of people's backyards and selling it at truck stops and um, cocaine by the time I was 18. Um, pornography, alcoholism, all through having kids and, and being married and it just, it was just a downward spiral. He and his friend had uh, smoked marijuana laced with PCP and uh, Ryan, they locked Ryan in the garage and he was out of his mind. And somebody called the police, and when they found him, he began to fight the police. And he was, you know, it, it, it's a horrible, horrible thing to see. He lost a lot of weight. He was um, withdrawn. He was, you couldn't, you couldn't connect with him anymore. I thought he was gonna end up dead or in jail. I really, really did. People wouldn't let me in their house anymore. I was going from house to house. I spent about four days just wandering from house to house, trying to get a place to stay. I remember him calling me up one night and saying, and crying, and saying he was uh, homeless, and he was uh, living uh, by a trash bin, and he was gonna kill himself if I didn't send him a certain amount of money. Uh, I had expended all resources. Uh, I had manipulated everybody I could manipulate. I had gotten all the money for my mom I possibly could. Oh, I was heartbroken and frightened. I cried a lot. I, I didn't really have much guidance on what to do. I didn't know how to handle Ryan at all. I didn't know. People get tired, you know, and, and his mom finally, at one point, said enough's enough, and um, I'm not doing this anymore. I gave him, I think, about $40 and a one-way bus ticket to Spokane. So that was it. He had no place to go, um, no anything. So they put him on a bus and up to Spokane, and he ended up at the homeless shelter in Spokane. Now I'm found. By the time I got to the mission, I was a meth addict. My brother-in-law, Frank, brought me to the Union Gospel Mission through the the uh, guest door in the back. And I remember walking in and I had a duffel bag full of clothes that were mostly dirty and that's all I had. But then I remember that evening sitting in the day room and just really feeling like, wow, this is bottom. And not knowing a whole lot about what was gonna happen next. It really impressed me. It was weird, you know, going through the showers and the whole thing, but it impressed me like they gave me pajamas. 
and a towel, and they took care of my clothes, and they would even wash them for me if I needed to, and I was just kind of, this is, it's a little different. I, you know, I hadn't had anybody do that for me a long time. Certainly couldn't do it for myself. Um, so getting the little yellow boxes and putting those in and having these pajamas and feeling clean, you know. Um, still worried, but just feeling clean and climbing in. Uh, I, bunk, I wish I could remember what bunk number it was because I, I, I want to say 23, but I'm not sure. But I remember it was an upper bunk. It was towards the back on the dorm on the right-hand side. <laughs> I go to that room every time we go up and visit. Um, but I remember going there. I remember climbing on the top bunk, and I remember laying there and uh, just having a sense uh, like I'd never had before of uh, resting in somebody's hand. I just felt like the bunk was just a hand, and I just felt like I was just um, I was resting there. And I had never felt that ever in my life have I ever felt that. It was 93 when I saw him at the Union Gospel Mission, and I felt if he kept, if he kept doing what he was doing or learning from you guys, from the Union Gospel Mission, that he was going to be okay. I remember sitting in the chapels, and the first, first few times sitting in the chapel, kind of, you know, snickering and going, oh, what's going on here? And then I remember some young people coming in there, and I remembered seeing, wow, there's teenagers that were about my age, that are not doing what I was doing when I was uh, their age, and it affected me. It, I saw something in that. But there was a long period of time during the process when he was at the mission that we would visit up north. We would go to my other sister's house for Thanksgiving, and Ryan and I would sit out on the front porch on this, you gotta imagine, 15 acres of trees and snow on the ground and and it's a log cabin and we're sitting out front playing our guitars and because we're both I was a worship leader before he was and and we're both uh, sitting out on the front playing our guitars and, and singing worship songs and those were the times that it took me two or three years for my mind to stop being blown uh, every time I would see him. The Union Gospel Mission was uh, Ryan's saving grace. It allowed him uh, to come into a, a place, a godly place, a place that um, was run by godly men and to see a different life, a life that could be lived without drugs, a life that could be lived uh, with God a life that could be holy. Somebody saw value in me, and I think that was one of the biggest things that was missing in my life is I, you know, I think that I had talent, there was good things in my life that as, as a younger kid, but I found my value in escaping from things and having fun and partying and drugs and all these things, and I never felt like somebody had just said, you're valuable, you can be used, you can, you can be a leader. And uh, when Randy first came up to me, Randy Altmaier, when he first came up to me when I was stacking chairs uh, in the dining hall, and he just said, hey, I was watching you, and I'm just wondering, you know, you'd be interested in, I see something in you, would you be interested in going on the program? And ever since then, it was just, it, from that moment, it was saying yes to the Lord. And I've never stopped saying yes. After I had moved out and was at the, uh, the apartment, I had moved out of the mission, was with my son um, on Fifth Street. And uh, after a short period of time, um, I began to waver a little bit in my, in my walk. Within a couple months, I had found myself just in a very dark place inside. And um, <clears throat> the one person, the only person I knew to go to was Randy Altmaier. And I walked into the mission. I just got an appointment with him, and I just sat with him and said, this is where I'm at. What should I do? And the first thing he said, he says, you need to get your kid and you in church. <laughs> and he invited me to, to his church, which is Glad Tidings Assembly of God. And then they found out I played guitar. So I helped him with worship a couple times. And then the youth pastor heard that I played guitar, and he asked me to come over and lead worship for the youth. And then uh, I remembered specifically sitting down um, with a young boy named Raymond. I think he was 13 years old. And he knew about my past a little bit. Um, and he had 
I said, I need to talk to you, Ryan. And I said, okay. And we sat down on a, on a pew. And uh, he had told me about his struggle with marijuana and wanted some advice. And at that very second, it was like we traded places for just a brief moment. And I saw the opportunity to change a life, which like I'd never seen before. Um, and so I gave him some advice and we prayed together. And from that minute, I knew God was gonna use me to change young people. The night before um, we got married, Ryan got a phone call and was offered this job down here. It was just a phone message, you know, we'd like to see a resume, but I knew, I knew right then, and I was crying so hard, Dustin thought somebody had died. <laughs> and I just told him, this is what's happening, and I think this is the Lord, and, and then we moved down here to Canby shortly after that. Kids respond amazingly to Ryan. Uh, he's got a very likable, personality, um, kids are drawn to him, and uh, he it, it's an advantage. He's able to um, talk with them and joke with them, but still keep it about Christ and keep it about the, what's real. Um, and so, yeah, he, he reaches them. Now, what happens over time is that you adapt to the direction that you're going. Can you imagine if somebody came to you and told you that one of your good friends was gonna die? I mean, it just came up to him and were like, one of your good friends is gonna die. Now, we can't imagine that right now because that's not happening, but I'll tell you something. Can you imagine what that would feel like? Wouldn't it feel like your whole world would come crashing to an end? Wouldn't it feel like all of a sudden the world stopped and you just went flying emotionally? Wouldn't it feel like that? Really, the only person I really knew at this church besides my sister uh, was Ryan. And I went up to him and I was just went up to his office and I remember uh, just being like, you know, Ryan, uh, I, I, man, I want to start meeting with you. You know, I want to start talking. I want to know more about God. Just tell me what the Bible says about this. Tell me what God knows about this. It's the whole reason why I'm standing in front of you today. It's the whole reason why I can even have the guts to be here. It's because Jesus Christ got a hold of my life and I will let him do that. I will let him do that. That breath of life that Jesus has breathed into him, he is breathing in to the kids around him. God just opened the opened the floodgates for me. I mean, I just wanted to know so much about him and just uh, Ryan was there uh, to help me through that and any questions I had. I am still amazed every time somebody asks me for advice or asks me to do something bigger or grander, I just keep looking behind me, saying, are you talking to me or the guy behind me? <laughs> Is there another guy? But in, in essence, that's no different than the first time that Randy saw me stacking chairs and said, you. And I, I remember saying then, are you sure you mean me? But what I've known is that that's a good thing to feel, but you still got to say yes. I, I don't know why me. Um, I, um, I've got no training. I've got no, uh, certainly no right to be where God's brought me. It's gotta be his grace. Um, if there was a reason why I would think, I think I just said, yeah, I'll serve you, Lord, for the rest of my life, and that is, that's the one thing that I know more than I know anything else is that I know I will never stop serving the Lord. I absolutely see God's grace on our lives. Um, it, it's that undeserved, it, it's that undeserved, you know, God hands you these gifts, you know, and all these kids in our lives are gifts. I can see God's grace on my life in a way that um, probably bigger than any other thing I see is his favor and his grace, his forgiveness. Ryan has, um, he messed up his life and by the world standards, you know, deserved nothing. And God's grace. Hmm. Yeah. God's grace was able to pick him up and carry him through those steps of healing and that redemption and now to turn around and see him 
um, not only have healing in his relationships with his own kids, but with his family, and to turn around and to have such a phenomenal impact. I've done so much wrong, and I still do. And so I, you know, sometimes I keep waiting, okay, when does the, the hammer, when does the road end? And it just never does. His grace is, is, is as sufficient for me now when I make mistakes in leadership as it was when I was making mistakes uh, using drugs and doing things like that. He's loved me the same ever since. My husband is all about grace. That is one thing that I, um, if I could think of any word to um, describe Ryan, it is grace. He's full of it. He extends it because he's received it. Sing God's praise. I cannot express enough how much the Union Gospel Mission has meant to our family. I um, can't be more grateful. Every night I say a prayer, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done to my son. I, I think what I would say, if, if I had anything to say to the people who have donated money to the Union Gospel Mission is thank you. Um, just thank you. You've changed my life. You've changed my husband's life. Um, you've changed the lives of his kids. Um, you've changed the lives of the hundreds of kids that he ministers to uh, down here. And it's a hundred miles away, hundreds of miles away from where you're located now. And just thank you. And everybody's got value. So I'd say, don't give up. Keep giving. Keep looking for value. And, and keep being there because uh, I'm just one little story. There's millions of others that are just waiting to come out. 